I think it was three weeks ago, uh, since I last preached. For me, it's like a, a long time right, already. And I'm pleased again this morning to be back here uh, to uh, proclaim God's truth to you. Now, we are continuing our study on the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, uh, let us look at the parable as recorded in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. So please turn with me to Luke chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 22 through 30. Verse 22 through verse 30 of Luke chapter 13. Okay, as usual, let me first read our text. Luke 13 beginning in verse 22. And he, that is Jesus, went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be whipping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves trust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, they are last who will be first, and they are first will be lost. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we pray again that as we come and open up your word, that you might speak to us. Help us to understand your truth, that the Spirit of God might give us enlightenment and grant us understanding. We pray too that you humble our hearts to examine our life in light of your truth, that we may bow to the authority of your word. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the parable that we are looking at uh, this morning here is uh, one of those that we might call uh, a kind of a borderline parables. You know, there are long parables and there are very short parables. Short parables is more like just a a picture, all right? And this is one of those shorter ones. We have other examples actually in this chapter. For example, in verse uh, 18, Jesus says, What is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed. So this is like another borderline parable, just a picture of a mustard seed. And then we have another one uh, in verse 20. And again he said, To what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven. Okay, so here is another picture, all right, that of the leaven. So we have all these, what we call short or some people call the borderline parables. So the one that we are looking at this morning is one such uh, parable. Now this parable is an important parable for us to study because it is about salvation. It's about entering the kingdom of God. I hope this morning that such a subject is a uh, subject of great interest to you, right? a subject of great you know, importance, a subject that you would want to uh, hear about. And so this is what the parable is about. Now, we actually have a similar parable uh, in another gospel. Uh, maybe that one is even more familiar with many of you. And that is the one recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, right, Matthew chapter 7, and uh, 
verse 13. Now here Jesus said, oh, this is part of his long sermon on, on the mount. In verse 13 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. And so here in Matthew 7, we see a similar parable, except that perhaps the focus of both parables uh, is different. There in Matthew, the emphasis there or the focus there is about the choice that you have to make. Here is the narrow gate or the small gate, and here we have the big or the broad gate. And Jesus is there saying that we should choose not to enter the broad and the big gate where that is more appealing and more popular and more people want to go that way. But Jesus there is urging us to choose the narrow gate or the small gate. It's not popular, right? not appealing, but it says that this is the gate that leads to life. That gate leads to destruction. And so there Jesus is uh, emphasizing on the choices that we have to make concerning the gospel. But here in this parable, I say, though similar, but the focus is different. And the focus here, or the emphasis here, is on the effort. So you look again at verse 24. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. So he is now saying to us, look at this gate, this small gate into the kingdom of God. And Jesus in this parable is saying that you should enter this gate, but the emphasis here is that you should make effort. You should strive to enter through the narrow gate. Is there anyone here who has not yet entered through the narrow gate into the kingdom of God? Now here is Jesus' appeal to you, if you have not yet entered the gate, that you should make effort, you should strive to enter the gate. Now you see, there is a context to this parable, as with many of Jesus' parables. In other words, there was always this occasion or the reason why Jesus told the parable. And the context for this parable is in the earlier verses, verses 22 and 23. Now, you see, the context of Jesus' parable or this, of this parable is the question asked by someone in the crowd. So in verse 22, we are told that when Jesus was going through the cities and the villages, preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. That's what he's doing on his way to Jerusalem. Then we are told in verse 23, that someone in the crowd, as so often happened, stood up and asked Jesus a question. And his question is this, Lord, are there so few who are saved? Are there so few who are saved? Now, you might perhaps expect Jesus to answer either yes or no to that question. It's a simple question. Are there going to be few people who are saved or many? But Jesus did not answer that way. Jesus' answer was this. He said, strive to enter the narrow gate. In other words, Jesus, in his response to this man's question, is almost like brushing his question aside and say that that is not the most important question. Wisdom is to ask not only the right question, but the most important questions of life. And so Jesus here brushed him aside and say that your chief and your immediate concern should not be that, but rather your chief and your immediate concern should be are you in? It's not how many will be in the kingdom of God. Will there be many or few? But Jesus says, your question should be, are you in? And how can you get in there? And Jesus therefore is saying that here is something that you should know about entering the kingdom of God. Here is something that you should know about entering the kingdom of God. In other words, he said there's something that you should know about salvation. 
Yes, there are many things that we know about salvation already, perhaps. We know that salvation is by grace alone. You've been in this church for long enough, you know that that is what we believe. That salvation is by grace alone. And salvation is through faith alone. And salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Now we know many things about salvation, but here is something else Jesus said that you ought to know about salvation. Something else he says that you ought to know about salvation. And what is that? And, and Jesus says here, and it is this, that you also need to know that salvation requires effort. Salvation requires effort. Now that may sound surprising. I thought this is grace church. We thought we believe that salvation is by grace alone. And yet we see in the Bible, Jesus is saying here, strive. And strive here means to make every effort. Strive, of course, gives you the connotation of, of, of effort, of being diligent. And that is what Jesus is saying here. That there is this thing that you must know about salvation. And that is salvation requires effort. Not that we are saved by our own effort, but that Effort must be there to seek it. Effort must be there to seek salvation. Like you see in chapter 12 and verse 31, but Jesus say that the people of the world in verse 30 seek after many things. But then he says in verse 31, but you seek first the kingdom of God. There must be this earnestness in seeking salvation, in seeking after the kingdom of God, in seeking to enter through the narrow gate into the kingdom of God. This is a constant emphasis in the Bible. Do not think that because we believe that salvation is by grace alone, therefore we are simply to be passive about this matter of salvation about this matter of entering through the kingdom of God. That is not what the Bible teaches. We are not to be passive. But rather we see in the Bible these terms like making effort or striving or being diligent. Just as the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, where he said, He who seek me, and God said, He who seek me, shall find me if he seek me diligently. You, you see what the Bible is saying? That there ought to be this diligence, this effort, this great you know, earnestness in seeking after God and his salvation. And so that is what Jesus is saying in this parable recorded by Luke in Luke chapter 13. Strive, he says. That is your that ought to be your immediate and perhaps your most important concern in life. Yes, we are concerned about many things, especially in this time, but this, Jesus said, ought to be your most immediate and important concern, and that is to make every effort to seek after the kingdom of God, to strive to enter the narrow gate. And so we're going to spend the rest, the remaining time here this morning to consider this urgent appeal by the Lord Jesus Christ. To consider this urgent plea by the Lord Jesus Christ that we should be diligent or we should strive to enter the kingdom of God. Let us now consider this urgent appeal by the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, by considering what does it mean? What is Jesus saying? What does he mean by striving to enter the narrow gate? Strive to enter the narrow gate. What does it mean? What, what, what do you think Jesus had in mind as he looks at the crowd and as he appeals to them, as he tells them to do this? What does it mean to strive? 
let me tell you four things what it should mean. At least four things. I think there may, it, it, it will be many other things. At least four things what it should mean. Firstly, do not give excuses. Do not give excuses. That seems to be what Jesus is saying here in the first place to this man who stood up and asked him that question about the kingdom of God. Do not give excuses under the cover of so-called unanswered questions. The so-called unanswered questions. Why are you not ready to enter, Jesus says. Why are you still lingering there? There are many people who are like this man. They have heard the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has been preaching the kingdom of God through the villages and the cities. And this man probably was among the crowd following him and he heard the Lord again and again, emphasizing that we should repent and enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus is asking that question. There are many people like that, but they have not yet entered. So why, why are you waiting? Why are you not ready to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? For many people, it is exactly like this man. He says, Lord, until all my questions are answered, right? I'm not ready yet to embrace you. I have a lot of questions. I met with people who want to meet up with me and, uh, and they have many questions. They have many questions. They ask me questions like, you believe in the doctrine of election? Uh, you ask questions like, what about these other people who have never heard the gospel? You see, there are many people who, have, who want all their questions answered before they are ready to make the next so-called move towards embracing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they are not ready. And that's why perhaps this man is not ready. He said, Lord, I have one more question. Are there many or few who are in the kingdom of God? What was Jesus' response here? I said Jesus' response was to basically ignore his question. He said, you can leave that question to God. All right, perhaps one day you have all the answers. When you're in the kingdom of God, you can stand before God and you can ask God a hundred and one questions or a thousand and one questions like, will babies be saved? And people like to quarrel you know, and debate over that question. Even though the Bible has no clear answer to that, but we want answers. Or we ask questions like, what about those who have never heard the gospel, those in Timbuktu, would they be saved? I said, leave that to God. All people ask questions like, how do I know if I, if I am one of the elects? You see, if you want all your answers, all your questions to be answered before you come to Christ, you may never come to Jesus Christ. You may never come to Jesus Christ. And that is what Jesus is saying to this man. Stop giving excuses under the cover of so-called unanswered questions. What Jesus said is this, the important question is not how many would be in the kingdom of God. The important question is whether you are in the kingdom of God. Are you saved? Never mind how many will be saved. Maybe a million people, maybe a billion people, maybe few, maybe many. What about you? Now that is what Jesus is saying to this man. Are you saved? That is the important question. The important question is a question asked by the Philippine jailer in Acts chapter 16. Men or sirs, what must I do to be saved? The important question is the question asked uh, even in the gospel here in chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and uh, verse 25 asked by the, that, that scribe. He came to Jesus. And he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now that is the important question. What must I do to be saved? What must you do to enter into heaven to receive eternal life? Do you have the, the answer to that question? Yeah, you might have a thousand other questions, but not this question. Jesus says, this is the immediate and the important question. 
So do not give excuses. Come, stop, you know, giving all kinds of reasons. And secondly, to strive also means that you must be serious. You must be serious about the kingdom of God. You must make it a matter of priority. The question of salvation ought to be the question that is uppermost in your mind. That day in, day out, if you are not yet in the kingdom of God, tonight, when you're in your bed, pull up your, your pillow as you will, and sit and think, why are you not yet in the kingdom of God? Are you in or not? Be serious about this question. That is what Jesus means here. To strive means to be serious, to make every effort to hear the gospel. Look at what Jesus said earlier on in the gospel in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In another parable, he says this. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 12. Listen to what Jesus said here. Luke chapter 8. Uh, Luke chapter 8 and uh, verse 12. Jesus said, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Why does the devil want to take the word out of people's heart? Why does the devil want to stop people from hearing the word of God? Why? Have you ever asked the question? Why the devil is so intent that people do not hear the word? Why the devil is so intent to make sure that churches don't preach the word? Why the devil is so intent that you don't read the word? Do you care whether you pay attention to the word of God or not? Do you care whether you hear the word of God or not? I tell you, the devil cares. He wants to make sure that you don't hear. And that's what this verse is talking about. That his word that falls by the wayside soil, we are told here that the devil makes sure that the word is out of your heart. Why? He says here, lest they should believe and be saved. Because the devil understands the importance of the word of God. He understands and believes what Paul said in Romans 10 and verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many people do not believe in that. Many Christians don't believe in that. We don't believe that faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And that's why we are not earnest and diligent in proclaiming the word of God because we don't believe in the power of the word. But the devil believes. It's amazing. He believes a lot more than we do. And because he believes in that, he wants to make sure that you don't hear the word. And if you do hear it, he wants to take it away from you. And then Jesus said, Luke chapter 8 and verse 18, Therefore, take heed. Take heed how you hear. Therefore, you must be careful. You must be diligent. That's what Jesus is saying here. You must be earnest in hearing the word of God because it is so important. Because it is what that leads to salvation. Isn't that what Paul said to Timothy? That from childhood you have known the Holy Scripture which is able to make you wise unto salvation? You see, Timothy's mother and his grandmother understood that. His mother and grandmother had that great conviction that the word of God is able to make you wise unto salvation. That's why they pay that, pay attention to, to teaching their children. How many parents believe in that? That we would, we would teach our children. We believe that without the word of God, they will not be made wise unto salvation. 
They will not be saved. As far as we understand from the word of God, there is no faith if there is no word. For faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And that's also the reason why. This every writer in the, of the Bible understands this and is fully convinced of this. And that's also the reason why the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 1. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. A constant plea by biblical writer to pay earnest heed to the word of God. He says we must pay the more earnest heed to the things which are heard. Why? Verse 3. For how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we neglect the word of God, you know what we are, what are we neglecting? When you neglect the word of God, you, do you realize what you are neglecting? Nothing less than eternal life. Nothing less than salvation. Nothing less than entrance into the kingdom of God. That is what Jesus is talking about. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Are you there? Have you entered? Are you diligent? Are you making every effort to enter through the narrow gate? Are you? That's what he means. What does Jesus mean when he says strive to enter through the narrow gate? He means, first of all, don't give excuses. Other people like to give excuses. They're always not ready. Always not ready. How long have you been in church? There are many people who have been attending church for years. Until today, they still say, I'm not ready. I tell you, you will never be ready if you always have excuses. Strive. Don't give excuses. Strive. Make every effort. Make every effort to enter through the narrow gate. But there is one more thing here. What it means? It means that do not resist the prompting of God. Do not resist the prompting of God. What does that mean? Now you turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. And look at verse 9. Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Then he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What have you done, Cain? What have you done? You have sinned. You have committed a grievous sin. You have murdered your own brother. What have you done? God was speaking to Cain. That was kindness. That was the kindness of God. If you have sinned against God and God speaks through you, to you through his word. If God has brought someone into your life to tell you about your sin and ask you to repent, that is kindness. Because the Bible says, unless we repent, we perish. If you do not repent of your sin, you will perish for eternity. And so for someone to come and warn you, that is kindness. That's what we see here. And then we read in verse 13. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. It seems that he come under some kind of conviction. He could see what God is saying. He, he could not deny the fact that he has done something wrong. And someone comes to you when the word of God is brought to bear on you and make you see that you are a sinner. This is what we see here in Cain. But then, his response. So what do you do? What do you do when God speaks to you through his word? or through a brother, or a sister, or a friend, and bring you under some kind of conviction to make you realize your wretchedness and your sin. 
What do you do? Verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of the garden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now, can you see the problem here with Cain? God spoke to him. He was under some kind of conviction. And then he just brushed everything aside and go about his life as usual. He go about his life as usual. He married, he settled down with the family, he bare children, he built his city, and so on and so forth. He built his career, he built his life. Now what Jesus said is this. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. And that means do not brush aside all this prompting by the Holy Spirit. Very often God prompts us. Very often God makes us to realize things. Perhaps through the preaching of his word. Perhaps through your own reading of the Bible. Perhaps through confrontation of, uh, you know, of a friend who comes to you about your sin and about your life. Or perhaps just through the events of life in this world as we see the world gripped by fear of death. Every day we hear of people dying. We look at the numbers. Or perhaps you have just attended the funeral of someone, a friend, a family member, or a loved one. And perhaps kind of you, God might be prompting you to think about eternity, about the weightier things of life. And after the funeral, after the event, after church, you go out and you go about life as usual. The strife means don't, do not resist the prompting of God. And fourthly, to strive means this. It means that do not just hang around the gate. Right? Do not just hang around the gate. Many people love to talk just about the gate. They like to hang around the gate. They know quite a fair bit about the gate. Right? About that story there. About the gate. About the entrance. They know it very well. They know the gospel well. They've heard it many times. And they are always around the gate. They are always near to the sound of the gospel preaching. They are there in the church. They are always there when we have the youth camp, the church camp, or the gen team, or the youth activity. They are always there. They are always around the gate. But they never enter. But they never enter. They're hurt. They're around there. But they procrastinate. They never enter the gate. And what Jesus is saying here is this. It is not enough just to hear about the gate. Not just, not enough just to admire the gate. Some people love the gospel. They love to debate. They love to talk about the gospel. But they never embrace the gospel themselves. And Jesus says that is not striving. All right. Strive means don't just hang around. But enter. That is what Jesus is asking us to do. Let this is the second thing Jesus is saying here. First is what it means. And second, as we consider Jesus' plea here, is to understand why we must strive. Jesus says strive to enter through the narrow gate. But why? Why must we strive to enter through the narrow gate? Let me give you three reasons why. Three reasons why we must strive to enter through the narrow gate. Number one, because it is hard. It is hard. That's why you must make every effort to enter through the narrow gate. Listen to the Lord Jesus here. In the Gospel of Luke, right? Chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And here, again, when many people were following him, huge crowd, Jesus turned to them and said to them all, Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, verse 23, let him deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. There are people who want to make us believe or to think that it's all very easy. It's all very easy until they hear what Jesus says. If anyone wants to come after me, anyone wants to follow me, he says, note, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Does it sound easy? Does it sound like, you know, the walk in the park? Strive, we must, because Jesus says, because it is hard. It is narrow, it is hard. Verse 24, right? Luke 9, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Following Jesus Christ is like losing your life. And then towards the end of the chapter, in verse 57, now it happened as they journeyed on the road, perhaps these people have heard what Jesus is talking about. And there's this man with his brother, though, as he will. He comes to Jesus and he said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. I will. And Jesus said in the following verse, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Does this sound easy? Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Right. Now you see, to enter the kingdom of God, to enter through the narrow gate into the kingdom of God is a call to follow Jesus. Remember that. It is a call to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus, the Bible tells us, is to forsake your sin, is to deny yourself, is to forsake the world. Do not love the world, John says. Do not love the world. Now that is what it means to enter through the kingdom of God. That is to follow Jesus. It is to deny yourself. Now you can see that it is quite a decision. It is no simple matter. Therefore, it is often a struggle. These people, when they have heard Jesus, right, what Jesus said to them, now they realize that they would have to sit down and count the cost. Sit down and count the cost about following Jesus Christ. Secondly, why must we strive? First, it's because it is hard. Secondly, because a time will come when it will be too late. A time will come when it will be too late. Look at verse 24, Luke chapter 13, and verse 24, and Jesus continues here. In the second half of 24, it says, For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So for many, you see, you must strive, he says, to enter through the narrow gate, and then he gives the reason. For many, the reason is that for many will seek to enter and will not be able when, in fact, the sentence should actually continue through the next verse. So when, once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. In other words, the door will not be always open. And here we have the constant reminder from the Bible about salvation. Today is the day of salvation. So the door may not always be open. There will come a time when the door will be shut. So Jesus says here, for many will seek to enter. So that, that day when the door is shut, when the master comes and shut the door, he says, many will seek to enter. Amazingly, you know, the implication, the implied thing there is, is that even on that day, people were still knocking at the door and said, let me in, let me in. It is a sad thing to hear those knocks. It is sad that on that day, you still hear many people crying outside, let me in, let me in. But it will be too late. It will be useless, Jesus says. 
And these people in verse 26, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. You can hear the noises outside the gate and say, let me in, let me in. And then the master said, no, the door is shut. Say, master, no, no, wait, 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 listen to me. Only on that day that you are going to reason with the master, on that day you begin to tell masters what? He said these words, he said, do you remember we ate and drank in your presence? You were, you know, we were there. You, you broke bread. And then they said, you taught in our streets. Now these words are going to come back to haunt these people. You taught in our streets. That was what Jesus was doing all the time. Verse 22, remember Jesus was going through all the villages and all the city. That was his mission. He came to preach the kingdom of God, Mark tells us. And Jesus was faithfully doing that. And these are the people. They are outside not because they have never heard. And now they say, we have heard. You were the one teaching and preaching in our street. You came by. We were there. We heard you. But we are outside. Hearing alone is not enough. It's not enough. Coming to church alone is not enough. Doing all these things is all, all not enough. On that day, many people will say, hey, we were in church every Sunday. Why are we still outside? And the Lord says to these people, depart from me. Get lost. You workers of wickedness, of iniquity. You're not one of my. I do not know you. This is Something is going to haunt these people when they hear the Lord saying to them, I do not know you. Why strive to enter? Because a time will come. It may be too late. And finally, why strive to enter? Because of the joy of being inside and the horror of being outside. Listen to what Jesus said here. Verse 27, but I'll say to you, I do not know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And then, verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a phrase used by the Lord often in the Bible to describe destruction in hell. Where these people who are outside, they are going to face the judgment of God. They will be punished. They will be cast into hell forever and ever. They will be tormented. They will suffer. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The horror of remaining outside on that day will be too terrible to describe. The Bible has tried to describe it in many ways to give us some inkling, some ideas of what it means to be outside on that day. So it would be terrible on that day to be outside that door. But strive also because of the joy of being inside. Listen to what he says when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself trust out. Oh, you can only peep in messy world. You see Abraham, you see Isaac, you see Jacob, you see all the people of God, all the men and women of faith, all those who have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. You see them inside and they are feasting and they are enjoying bliss and eternal happiness with Christ. But you are outside, weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's why we ought to strive to enter through the narrow gate because of the joy of being inside and the horror of being outside. Let me ask you, are there some among us this morning perhaps still taking salvation lightly, not giving it the priority that it deserves? Are there some among us perhaps who are too preoccupied with other things in life? And think nothing of the kingdom of God? Are there some of us perhaps still hanging around the gate, admiring it? We love to debate about the gospel, 
but you never embrace it, then consider, hear and consider the tone of urgency in this parable. Strive. Make every effort to enter, to enter the kingdom of God before it's too late. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we know that once the master has come, the door will be shut and many will remain outside and cry and cry out, Lord, Lord, let us in. Oh, we pray that you might help us to understand the urgency of this plea that each one of us in this hall, everyone who is listening here this morning, may take heed to your plea and to make every effort to enter through the narrow gate. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.